I'm going to do something now, which I, I think I might cautiously suggest is one of the reasons why you listen to this program. And I'm not sure you'll hear it or find it anywhere else. I'm going to talk to you a bit about a bloke called John Hayes, who is uh, reportedly Suella Braverman's mentor. And he's very much on the right wing of the Conservative Party. He is the bloke to whom Suella Braverman was leaking sensitive documents when she was found to have broken the ministerial code, something which I believe she subsequently lied about. I tell the story in some detail in, in my new book, How They Broke Britain. But that's, that's by the by. It's just an indication of, well, A, how stupid she is, because one of the people that she sent the sensitive documents to, she did so in error. That's how, that's how the story came out. She thought she was sending the documents to him, this John Hayes character and his wife, who I think works for him. But she accidentally sent it to someone else, and it was they who brought the breach, the clear breach of the ministerial code to the attention of the chief whip. Of course, it was a, a breach so egregious that she was compelled to resign. Um, but Rishi Sunak reinstated her just a few days later. So this is Suella Braverman's mentor, and it's not 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 the word that I would use. And, and this is a story from three years ago when he was uh, called out by Jewish and anti-racism groups for indulging in what is widely well, what is an anti-Semitic conspiracy theory. Now, he's not unique in using the phrase cultural Marxism or cultural Marxist dogma. Paul Dacre, the editor-in-chief of the Daily Mail, has uh, been deploying it in his newspapers and indeed in, in speeches for many, many years, as, as, as many, I think, as 20, something else that I cover in my new, new book, How They Broke Britain. And these are people who are currently combining to condemn anybody minded to protest against the continuing bombardment of Gaza. They, they, they profess, of course, to be friends of... Israel. Um, that article I referred to earlier by Hugo Rifkind in, in the Times today talking about the dangers of um, uh, uh, allying with the illiberal right uh, contains this phrase, which is very relevant. People have the right to march against falling bombs, no matter who is dropping them. And I cannot suppress my horror at the idea of the Jewish community being used as a pretext for taking this right away. So just a suggestion that some of the loudest voices opposed to these marches may not actually belong to people who are proper friends of, of Jewish people. And that comes from one of the, um, the country's most prominent Jewish journalists. So cultural Marxism, in case you don't know, is a very right-wing conspiracy theory with deep and profound anti-Semitic origins. It, it centers on the idea that thinkers, Jewish thinkers, mostly Jewish thinkers from something called the Frankfurt School of Philosophy represent some sort of fifth column who want to undermine Western values. Uh, are, we, are you hearing any little bells tinkling in the background yet? Hasn't Suella Braverman been talking about criminalizing the undermining of Western values? lately. So this is an anti-Semitic trope. And as a member of, uh, I, I think they either, what do they call themselves, the Common Sense Group or the Anti-Woke Coalition, I'm not sure. But they wrote to the Telegraph, I think, three years ago, because the National Trust was publishing more history of its properties. I'll say that again, because it remains controversial. People like this chap, John Hayes, who is uh, a, a proud deployer of the anti-Semitic phrase cultural Marxism and is apparently the mentor of Suella Braverman, also has a problem with the National Trust publishing too much history of its own property. So they wrote that they want to, quote, speak for the silent majority of voters tired of being patronised by elitist bourgeois liberals whenever issues such as immigration or law and order are raised. That in response to the idea of a stately home that was built in large part with money raised from slavery, containing information on its premises that it was built with money raised in large part from slavery. God, I mean, good God, that the, the controversy, the horror is almost unbearable. And, and here is the mission statement contained in the letter to ensure that institutional custodians of history and heritage tasked with safeguarding and celebrating British values, there it is again, we'll have a conversation later this week about what the difference is between British values and French values or German values or Swedish values or, or, or whatever values, um, whatever country you, you, you may hail from. What, what are peculiarly British values? Because people like this, Suella Braverman's mentor, are convinced that they exist and they add are not coloured by cultural Marxist dogma. Interesting choice of word there, isn't it? The group's mission is to ensure that institutional custodians of history and heritage are not coloured by cultural Marxist 
dogma, which they claim is colloquially known as the woke agenda. So, so there it is. Now, over to Dr. Edie Friedman, who's the executive director of the Jewish Council for Racial Equality. And she told Vice News that it was not acceptable for politicians to use the term cultural Marxism, adding this has been promoted on the far right as an anti-Semitic conspiracy theory and has a dog whistle effect. Again, this is Suella Braverman's mentor. She adds no political party should be making use of tropes which reinforce racist, Islamophobic or anti-Semitic sentiments to support particular arguments and policies. Politicians have a responsibility to use language in such a way as to bring people together rather than exacerbate divisions. Um, David Lawrence from Hope Not Hate, the anti-extremism research group, added cultural Marxism is a conspiracy theory inflected with anti-Semitism and is commonly employed by the far right. It has even appeared in the manifestos of mass murderers. He's, he's quite right. And this wasn't the first time that John Hayes, who was the lead signatory of that Telegraph letter, deployed the phrase. He wrote in the Daily Express that same year, and I quote, for such cultural Marxists, identity must always be defined by a sense of grievance. People who spend their entire lives articulating their own deep and largely bogus sense of grievance, often wealthy, privileged, heterosexual white men, in this case with a knighthood, they're the real victims in our society. They're the truly oppressed members of British society. Um, on this occasion, he was attacking a museum for wanting to provide more history of the exhibits contained within the museum. So I think it's important to, to recognise that these are not necessarily people who have been completely open and transparent with you. When Suella Braverman claims that the marchers are, are hate marchers, as, and her mentor routinely deploys the phrase cultural Marxism, it leaves, it leaves certainly a certain amount of room for confusion. And funnily enough, um, when she was a backbench MP, guess who used the phrase cultural Marxism at an event about Brexit organised by the Eurosceptic headbangers, the Bruges Group? Any thoughts on that? Guess who used the phrase, the anti-Semitic phrase, cultural Marxism, when speaking to fellow headbangers at the uh, at the Bruges group in about 2019? Yeah, Suella Braverman. But it was only the board of deputies of British Jews who called on her to clarify her remarks and called for her not to use the phrase again. It's not, of course, the only time that Suella Braverman has been asked to moderate her language or clarify her remarks. A woman called Joan Salter did so last year at a constituency meeting in Fairham, where Suella Braverman remains the MP. And Joan Salter is, well, she's a Jewish Holocaust survivor. And she asked the Home Secretary to stop using language that remind her, Joan Salter, of the language used by the Nazis that killed her family in the 1930s. Suella Braverman's response was to say, no, I will not change the language that I use. I will not moderate the vocabulary I deploy, despite the fact that it reminds you, a Jewish Holocaust survivor, of the language that the Nazis who murdered your family were using in the 1930s. 2018. Jewish organisations called for the Conservative Party to investigate after a bizarre propaganda booklet making reference again to cultural Marxism was distributed at the party's annual conference. It did something that is more common, perhaps, than the kind of rhetoric we're seeing this week. It, it, it married Islamophobia with anti-Semitism in reference to something called the Great Replacement Theory, which was available at fringe meetings held by, wait for it, the Eurosceptic pro-Brexit think tank quotes the Bruges group. So, I mean, it could be a complete coincidence and it could be the case that despite deploying anti-Semitic tropes publicly on several occasions in the past, both Suella Braverman and her mentor have repented of such. To perhaps she will even offer a retrospective apology to the Jewish Holocaust survivor Joan Salter for continuing to deploy language that the Jewish Holocaust survivor Joan Salter found reminiscent of the language deployed by the Nazis who murdered their parents. But when Suella Braverman comes forward and talks about the people marching in the hope of seeing a cessation of the bombardment of Palestinian civilians as hate-filled or hate marches, you, you, I would suggest, have to wonder what precisely she's doing and who precisely she is appealing to. Um, and that is just one bloke on the radio providing you with 
information that is publicly available but not very widely reported, given that much of the newspaper market is dominated by people who are probably very comfortable with Suella Braverman's peculiarly toxic brand of ignorant provocation, up to and including the Daily Mail, which remains um, an unreliable news source, according to Wikipedia's own internal judgments. And that's the state of the nation. That's, that's the backdrop to the horrors that are unfolding at the moment. That's the context for the attempts by a Home Secretary historically charged with keeping the peace and promoting harmony amongst the people of these islands, deliberately, deliberately and transparently trying to foment violence, division and hatred. Because when Suella Braverman calls it a hate march, she is blowing a whistle, a dog whistle perhaps, but I'm not so sure that the, that the shrill tone is actually inaudible to all but her fellow travellers. She is blowing a whistle designed to muster a response. And as one caller has already told us, in the Islamophobic stroke football hooligan community, they know exactly what form they want that response to take. And I, I'm fairly persuaded that Suella Braverman does too. Why else call it a hate march? You can say there are hateful people on a peaceful march. You can say there are disgusting people on a peaceful march. You can say that we have seen evidence of at least two supporters of a terrorist atrocity upon an otherwise peaceful march featuring 100,000 people. But if you call it a hate march, you're making a call to arms. If you're too stupid to understand that that's a possibility, that counts as a valid defence but not after it's been pointed out to you. You call it a hate march, you're making it a call to arms. And if you marry it to some of the newspaper coverage that is being published at the moment in this country, people who feel uh, uh, or profess to feel a deep reverence for the poppy as a commemoration of our war dead, they are being told that the people on that march hate them, hate you, hate the poppy. That's the message, both subliminal and explicit, and that's what the Home Secretary is doing. And that's why we should all perhaps be very, very concerned that the highest, one of the four highest officers of state traditionally dedicated to domestic harmony and peace appears to be embarked upon provocation and rhetorical pyromania.